with more of a theoretical understanding of what are the interesting questions to i think there's a, a lot there's so much potential for for doing sort of high scale really large population long run evolutionary algorithms so yeah i think that is a um i was very excited by that and i think a lot's going to come out of that yeah and it's it's i think it kind of like there you can see an analogy with ai because there's a question of which one ultimately will we put our money on you know because it's it's very hard to make that decision to spend let's say 10 million dollars because like i think you know gpt3 I mean, I wasn't there for that. So this isn't like because I was part of that. I wasn't part of that. But I think uh, what I read in the in the media is it's somewhere around $10 million of training. Um, and so that was an a, that was an example of one of these things of let's let's just finally like just like put all our eggs in the basket, just go. Um, and like because like GPT-2 was not like, you know, particularly amazing. What it was was interesting. Like it's just interesting. Um, and it was very interesting actually because it was the seed of a revolution but like the people who recognized that were a special type of people because like they were willing to spend 10 million dollars to go to the next level and just no way to know that it would end up being like that revolutionary as it would be um and so but it's very uh, it's a very risky thing to spend 10 million dollars and that's like a, a that's a very scary bet placing thing and so like a, in the analogous event that would happen in a life it's got to be really um, principled, like the way that this is thought through. You know, like like you don't want to make you don't want to place that bet wrong because it'll set the field back by years. Um, like if we spend ten million dollars to do nothing, um, then it's like, well, yeah, a life is just like a bunch of wackos doing nothing. Um, you spend ten million dollars to get some little ants to run around in a circle. Like you've got to like re we need to really think about this. Like what's the equivalent of GPT two in the world of a life if it even exists yet? Or that it's the world to really double down and invest. Um, and I think that requires all of the all of the spectrum of insights that have come to bear in open-ended evolution, like to really get serious about like trying to use those plus a little dose of intuition um, to think about this, like what is a world that you would do that would turn into the equivalent of a GPT-2 to GPT-3 level event in this area? And it needs to be thought through very carefully, I think, because it's it's like so it is risky, not just in terms of wasting money, but to the field and its its reputation and ability to try again. And opening it gets super well, you could say super lucky, or else they were just super insightful um, to just invest in the right thing there. Because like at the time, like if you look at the the overarching field of AI, like the really leading edge stuff was in reinforcement learning which is like these the, uh, these systems that would use um, that, that would use neural networks, but they weren't large models in, in the sense of the giant large models of GPT-3. And they were part embedded inside of uh, an outer loop of a reinforcement learning algorithm, like a machine learning reinforcement learning algorithm. And like, those are the kinds of things that like built the, the world champion of, uh, beat the world champion of Go. So like, those are big deals. Um, and that's why they were sucking up most of the attention and money. Um, and even OpenAI was working on those a lot. Like they were working on on like uh, game players and Dota and things like that. Like putting a lot of resources into that. And so like to to then in that environment where that's the dominant thing, to then say let's invest an enormous amount on this crazy other thing, like that that's a daring and insightful move. Do you think um, COVID? Which, sorry, Ken. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do you think COVID was part of this? Because certainly what what Tim is saying with regards to the A-Life community. I was amazed that the A-Life community survived through COVID, but what happened was it came back, they didn't have the history of, mm. of you know, the three of us. <laughs> We've all experienced parts of the history of A-Life, but they come back with completely new eyes. And I think that was the same with regards mm. to GPT, that they were able mm. to get funding from completely new eyes because of COVID fundamentally. And I think COVID has been a turning point with regards to basic, and it's mixed metaphors for what you're both uh, saying, but yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a good theory. I mean, it's a good hypothesis, but I think it's actually not the case just because I happen to know a lot about that specific issue because I actually joined OpenAI right as COVID began. Mm. This was like a like that's why it's so memorable to me that moment in history. Like I know what was going on. You know, this is a horrible experience for me, but everybody obviously COVID started. So it's like March 2020. It happened to be just right then when I was leaving Uber and moving to OpenAI. So it was right there at the cusp of that. And so GPT-3 was already there. Um, and it was, it was like a really dramatic experience, you know, because like I was, um, because I had to start a new group and I couldn't actually ever meet them in person. It was like the weirdest thing. <laughs> um, and uh, it was, it was like really nerve wracking and obviously upsetting. And it's, but, but anyway, like, so like GPT-3 was there. Um, and I had meetings 
right before that happened, like I was being interviewed, like I was talking to the people like Ilya, where he was telling me about all these exciting things about GPT-3. Um, so that kind of inflection point had already happened. Um, and so I think that um, what caused it was something else, which is historical. I mean, there's always some historical precedent like that leads to some weird jump like that. Like it had to do with things like that, you know, this like Dario who, who had been um, at a different company, um, he had just, he had joined OpenAI at some point, I don't know exactly when, but he was like the co-lead scientist there with Ilya. And Dario had come up with these people telling him that something won't work if you don't do some fancy stuff. And he kept on having this experience that all he had to do was scale this thing up. Um, and like, it wasn't an, it wasn't a, a language model, but he just had, had come to this um, philosophical conclusion that scaling is way more powerful than people give it credit for. Sure. Um, and it's so other people believe that, but I think he might've been one of the people who believed it the most. Like he truly believed it in his soul that that's like everything you need is scaling. And to this day, cause he found it anthropic. I think that's like what's driving him. And I actually think he might be going too far in that direction, but it sort of gets you over the hump of, should we really spend this money on this? Now that's just speculation. Again, I wasn't there when it happened. And I'm sure Ilya, Ilya who, who comes from a different background, you know, where he was like looking at larger and larger neural networks and in, in, in deep learning for vision purposes and things like that also had some of that spirit. So it all kind of converges at a point. But you have to take it all and then look at this bizarre artifact, which is GPT-2, which is like not like better on some objective metric, which is in an a life -y sense interesting. I think GPT-2 is a really interesting A-life artifact because it sort of like looks like a life form. Like it talks kind of like a person, although it's an idiot, um, totally. you know, and it, it could do things that are like reminiscent of life. Um, but then to say, all right, well, all of our beliefs and ideas and stuff, like they all converge at this point. We're like, this thing is where we can really double down. And I think that somehow happened. I still don't know the full, like, expl I mean, Sam's also part of it because Sam was, Sam's obsessed with scaling, but from a different, like Sam was obsessed with the idea of scaling Sam Altman in terms of, um, the scaling of anything like a company, you know, going from like, uh, like a small little startup to 10 X to 10 X to 10 X next and you're like a hundred billion dollar company and Sam, you know, cause he was running Y Combinator. And so he had that kind of like business perspective of scaling. So it's a great, it's a great unit unifier with this other kind of neural network perspective of scaling. Like I, I'm like making all this up cause this isn't necessarily the way they would tell the story, but it seems to come together with like why this happens. Um, and so it's like a very his interesting historical event because it, it's a high risk event. Like, why would you invest? Like everybody asked me, like, like why, why did, cause I was at OpenAI. Everyone's like, why did it happen at OpenAI and not Google or something? Like Google had way more Certainly. resources and stuff. Certainly. Like, why didn't they just spend $10 million? It would have been less risky for them. But yeah, they, they couldn't take that risk. And so we have to figure out like in the A-Life, like what is the equivalent like event and inflection point that would merit this kind of investment is harder for us, which is why it's taking longer because we have less social capital. Like it doesn't, it's not as clear what the benefit's gonna be for humanity, which makes it much harder because the arguments are there. Like, why would this be great if it did work out in AI? It's obvious. Um, but I still think that like the payoff is still so significant that like it can be done. Like it can, it can, the argument can eventually win the day at some point, but it's gotta be some kind of historical convergence of ideas like that would happen there um, at the right time and place, um, which just hasn't happened yet. Certainly. I mean, I think you're talking to exactly the metaphor I was using with regards to a life, uh, what happened through COVID, because obviously it's a detailed history. It's a series of papers. I'm not sure if either of you have talked to Tom Ray recently, but it was one of the most moving experiences I had um, doing both live. I was actually talking to Tom Ray. It's the first time I had a group of his students basically hanging out in the chat, um, you mm. know, interacting. Um, and Tom Ray is just phenomenal and obviously very central to the stuff that we've been talking about specifically. But um, certainly going into COVID, um, my thought was that this thing is not going to survive being A-life. What's happened actually is a bunch of people who hadn't historically been involved with A-life are now flooding the thing. And it's interesting, Tim says that the A-life conferences are about the same size, because certainly I'm not sure if you watched the, the group that were basically tuning in for your talk, but I watched the group that was tuning in for my talk on, on both occasions um, and was just amazed because I ended up with a room that was very similar to whatever the Artificial Life Conference I attended in 2012 was. I kind of remember what A-Life number was. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was that kind of incident where I realised that this community has grown well beyond anything that I could have imagined mm. going into COVID. Uh, but COVID seems to be a model, particularly with regards to bringing new ideas, the history of A-Life, you know, there are people who are now senior researchers who are doing 
four postdocs in uh, and don't know about um, Tierra or uh, Cold War or any of the kind of building blocks that we've yeah. all obviously had something to do with. So what's really fascinating is just getting a sense that, um, yeah, that something around COVID basically changed. Particularly, oh. I'm, I'm familiar with the history of OpenAI around that period of time too, but I was talking more specifically with regards to AI life specifically. Tim, your yeah. thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if I've got anything to add about that. Um, I, I, I think I've said already um, the various changes I've noticed from pre-COVID 2019 conference in Newcastle to 2024. Um, it, yeah, actually at the uh, conference dinner, they said, um, please put your hand up if, you're, if this is the first A-Life conference you've attended. And it was nearly half, nearly wow. half the people, which cool. uh, I was really surprised at. And that's, yeah, that's very encouraging. So I don't know where they're all coming from. I, well, so it's, it's the first A Life conference I've been to for five years, but um, that's not to say there haven't been, there's still been a conference every year. Um, although they've been online until the last one uh so yeah maybe i don't know i don't know if uh during covid people more people found out about a life through or more people mm. were able to attend maybe conferences because they were virtual and therefore a lot cheaper to get to i mean maybe that was mm. some of it mm. that so, is that is encouraging i think that's yeah. really nice um the resilience of this community I, yeah. I mean, I wasn't there for the this A life, and and uh, but I'm really happy like to hear that. And it's kind of a, you know, I sometimes notice that um, people who become disillusioned with AI sometimes start coming over to A life just to see what's going on. Um, I've known some very top tier AI researchers that have done that, and like they're they're nobodies in the crowd in A life. Nobody really knows who they are, but but they're just like sick of the whole like way that the whole culture works in in AI, which is very benchmark driven. And yeah. they're just like, this is a more open-minded place. There's pros and cons to both, obviously, you know? Um, like, there's also downsides to being super open-minded. Like, you, you get more cranks, basically. But you also have more creativity. And so it's, like, worth kind of peering over to the other side and seeing what's going on there. And, and like, sometimes more interesting ideas are, are, are happening there. So I would encourage anybody, just in case there's an audience here, who's uh, interested, like who is an AI person to go over and check out A-Life because it's super fun. It's true that like the rigor like quotient is less or something, you know, it's like there's a little bit more kind of like we'll just do stuff because it's fun. But like still, like there's way more creativity there. Um, and the trade-off can be worth it, like to give you new ideas and stuff like that. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's been an amazing conversation. There were a couple of things I wanted to end up with. I have a story of a million dollar run. Uh, we should probably do that for another conversation. Let's move that one <laughs> aside. Um, but uh, yeah, I think certainly a lot of really interesting stuff. I was contacted on Sunday by Dave Diemer, um, who you might have heard of. Um, he and Bruce Damer have been working together and he actually discovered my IEEE paper um, from, I don't remember when it was, 2004. Uh, and decided to contact me because he wants to come on this podcast or video cast as it is now. So it'll be wonderful having David Deemer on. Uh, something, uh, there's a phenomenon that's been occurring recently, which has been distilled in Google Discovers A Life, um, which I think is a very interesting metaphor. But I've been contacted by a number of people just in the past week uh, associated with this phenomena. And I know, Tim, you actually talked about it at the A Life conference. And I didn't realize um, Andy Pagelis did a, 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 a the paper you passed on to me from 1996 struck me as just being very fascinating because obviously you've got Margaret A. Bowden's book coming out then. Obviously you have Tim Leary already. Uh, sorry, Stephen Levy. Um, but it's just a phenomena that 1996 was kind of a turning point with regards to a lot of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about your, your conversation um, about the uh, Google Discovers A Life um, sure. idea that's currently going on? Sure. So just to put it in some context, uh, I mean, a lot of, um, well, some of the viewers may have seen this in the news. It's, it took, it's, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of news coverage over the last few weeks about a team in Google in Zurich um, who have, they created a computational universe uh, 
in which they've put injected random instructions of computer code and uh, random programs and they witness the emergence of self-replicating programs so programs that would copy themselves into an adjacent um programs memory space so they would yeah they would um they would reproduce in that way so it's the emergence of self-replicators from a an initial um uh random soup of instructions so somewhat akin to the digital origin of life um and so lots of news sources pick this up it, there's an archive paper about this but it's not yet been peer reviewed and one of the things that struck me when i read the headline was i immediately thought of this paper i remembered from andy pargelis in 1996 who pretty much done almost exactly the same thing so he he created a system where he filled up a a um, a, a memory in in the computer with random instructions uh from his own a special computer program programming language that he had invented himself um and yeah he lo and behold found self-replicating programs emerging uh so it, it's the same in both of these examples both pargelis's work and the the latest work i'm kind of they so that these are languages that well in pargelis's Pargelis's case, he made up the language in which these programs were written specifically so that you could have very short self-replicating programs. And although Google didn't invent their own language, it was a very simple language they use such that you could get very simple self-replicators. And then they run the system for a long time, injecting random programs into it. And all of a sudden they find a self-replicator. So, I mean, to look at it from a uh, critical point of view, you could say, well, that's just really proving the laws of probability that you've got a, a system where you're quite likely to find self-replicating programs. And lo and behold, if you run it long enough, you find a self-replicating program. Um, that's being a bit harsh on it. but uh, There are, I, I guess, one thing you could expect or hope to see evolve out of that would be some interesting kinds of self-replication um so maybe some forms of self-replicating algorithm that you've not thought of before um i don't know if there was anything particularly interesting in this google preprint but and what they're doing is slightly different to park ellis but um yeah anyway so i had the opportunity to speak to one of the uh, co-authors of this paper who was head of this lab in, in uh, zurich so Ettore Rendazzo. Um, and yeah, he was generally, he's coming into this area of a life quite new. So he, yeah, he was an interesting guy to talk to and very helpful, uh, very grateful to be uh, uh, pointed in the direction of previous work in this area. So yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting to talk to him. It's, I mean, I, I find it interesting in itself that google have a research group in zurich who are doing this a life type work and it's not just this particular paper they're doing a variety of other papers similarly exciting a life type stuff in cellular automata and other such fields so yeah i look forward to seeing what comes out of it um but also it was good to have that conversation and he was genuinely grateful to be pointed to some prior work in that area So we'll see what comes out of it. Certainly. Gentlemen, I think we've had a wonderful conversation today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you both. Um, this is what we try to do here in Last Monkey Standing. And uh, I, Imi Khan and I had a very wonderful conversation previously, and I've recorded some great videos, but this is a standout one from the ones that I've recorded so far. So thank you very, both very much for bringing a quality of discussion that uh, is just very easy to listen to and very enjoyable. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Ken. It's been a pleasure.